It's been three years since my Emiliette disappeared in San Diego, California. It happened within days of her seeking a divorce from her husband, who now sits in jail awaiting a murder trial. Now, he says she ran off, leaving her money, her cell phone, her identification, and her children at home. <laughs> Are you buying this? Well, hey everybody, welcome to Profiling Evil, and yes, I got a terrible cold right now, but it isn't stopping me from sharing some new information on Maya Miliete, the missing woman from San Diego, California. Thanks for subscribing, and thanks for hitting the like button and all of that stuff, and please consider sharing Profiling Evil with your friends. Now, Maya Miliete, She's a woman who goes by May also, was born back in 1981. When we look at her victimology, this woman grew up in Hawaii. By age 19, she'd met and married a 19-year-old named Larry Miliete. This is a kid who had moved to Hawaii in an attempt to distance himself from juvenile gang-related crimes that he was involved in as a young man. Now, to the casual observer... Larry seemed like he had his life on track. He, he served a five-year stint in the Navy, and the couple eventually made their way back to Southern California. Larry worked at the Naval Medical Center as an optician, and Maya worked at the Navy Information Warfare Center. Now, they both had really busy schedules, but somehow this couple brought three children along, and the family continued to see them, including extended family. And family is what seemed most important to them. You know, life seemed pretty good. And the couple seemed pretty content. Except for now we're learning to those who knew them more intimately. When Maya disappeared on January 7th in 2021, she was working as a contractor for the Navy in the U.S. Department of Defense assigned as a, an administrative specialist. Now, all the reports, again, this is really important to think about this victimology. All of the reports suggest that Maya was excelling in her work. She was liked by her uh, bosses, and she was liked by her peers. The couple's life suggested that they were really devoted parents who were in a committed marriage. But it appears that their public life was a little bit different than their private life. As stories are surfacing since her disappearance, stories going back to before her disappearance of infidelity, domestic violence, and the fact that she revealed the day before her disappearance that she wanted a divorce. Now, stepping back a few years, it appears that Maya started gaining independence. And as she gained independence... Larry became increasingly controlling, perhaps even paranoid if publicly released reports are accurate. Now, these media reports quote investigators who revealed that the couple began having marital problems, at least pretty severe marital problems, a year before Maya disappeared. Violence. In one domestic violence situation, Larry reportedly choked May until she passed out. Now, that's serious domestic violence. Now, in an attempt to save the marriage, or in my opinion, from a profiling perspective, regain control of Maya, Larry reportedly began reaching out to psychics and spell casters, hoping to have them cast a spell that would make Maya fall back in love with him. He knew that she wasn't in love with him any longer. When that didn't appear to be working, Larry upped the ante, so to speak. And he asked the spellcasters to incapacitate Maya so that she would have to depend on him more. Now, on the day of Larry Miliete's arrest, we're going to move forward a little bit and then come back. The San Diego district attorney made the following comment when she was talking about this arrest and motive. She said this while speaking with the press. She said that the spell requests that he was doing through these spellcasters began to escalate, and he started asking that they cast a spell that Maya would have bodily harm. In fact, they cite one email where he asked the spellcaster specifically, 
Could you make Maya have broken bones so that she could stay at home? Well, the DA didn't pull any punches and said, this is all part of the evidence she's going to present, and it's Larry's homicidal ideations to harm May. On the afternoon of January 7th, this is again 2021, Larry sent a really interesting text, and he said, I think she wants me to snap, and I'm shaking inside, ready to snap. Holy cow. You know, I talked about this on Court TV last night with Vinnie Politan, an FBI retired agent named Bobby Chacon, who's a really good friend of mine, and another person I really like a lot, Erica Morse. She's a private investigator. And in that interview, Bobby remarked that uh, Larry never cast a spell to have Maya come back, back to the house and the kids when she went missing. Why not? And I thought that was a really interesting exchange to start with. So let's watch that. Another fact that's really stuck in my side in all this is that the entire community was coming out and they were looking everywhere that they could, all the hiking trails and all these different potential places. Um, yet Larry never joined the searches. Never, never, never crossed his mind that maybe I should go look for her. Yeah, never, never put a spell on to have a return or something like that, right? I mean, so, so you know. That is, wait, wait a minute, Bobby. That is gold. That is gold. Say that again. So hopefully prosecutors hear you and if use it, was, it in the in, in their in their case. If he was such a believer in these spells, wouldn't he have reached out for one of these many people that he was trying to cast? But hey, can you cast a spell to have her come back to the house for the kids? You know, like if he's that, a concerned father and a believer in spells. You know, that would be the first thing I would think he would do if he if he actually believes in these spells, right? Uh, well, folks, this is a perfect time for me to remind you to take a moment, share your thoughts on what this form of nonverbal uh, behavior is suggesting. Now, listen, you can put your comments down below. And since you're doing that, if you're new to Profiling Evil, please take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button, and make sure that you're getting all of our notifications. Now, as you're thinking about your responses, why do you think Larry quit paying for those hexes once Maya disappeared? Uh, it's completely circumstantial, but it's really important behavior. Did he simply give up hope and wash his hands? This one's interesting. And put your comments down below. Now, three years is an awfully long time, so I thought we'd just take a look back at the key dates in this case to refresh all of our memories. And here are a couple of things that we know today. Just before her disappearance on January 7th, 2021, Maya was in contact with a divorce attorney. And reports suggest that she even communicated with the attorney on the day before she disappeared. Now, some suggest even the day she disappeared, if, if you get her either before midnight or after midnight. When Maya's family started wondering what had happened to her, she wasn't answering their texts and wasn't socializing like she normally did. Some theorized that she might have gone for a hike in the canyons behind their home. Now, they assumed this because her vehicle was still at home. Her wallet was at home. Uh, do you remember there was some really good video surveillance that came out about that time, too, on the day she disappeared, or if it was early morning hours, the day after she disappeared, it showed her pulling up in her vehicle in front of her home and unloading the car. To me, that was a sign she wasn't planning on getting out of Dodge. She wasn't loading it with her stuff. She was unloading it. Everything appeared normal, including conversations that she appeared to be having with one of her children. That, to me, is really significant behavior in this thing, suggesting that Maya was staying at home and was going to try to go through this in as uh, strategic and uh, adult way as possible. The night. And those same cameras that saw her parking her vehicle at 4.42 p.m. never show her coming out and leaving the residence any time later. So... Another question that keeps bugging me is if she went for a hike, why was her mobile phone missing? And more importantly, if it was missing and she had it, why was it turned off? Because there are no signals 
coming from that phone after 1.25 in the morning. Now, the investigation and court documents, as well as a lot of media reports, reveal that the couple had an argument on the evening of January 7th. It was that same night that neighbors are reporting that they could hear the kids out back playing in the yard at about 10 p.m. And this is something that was completely out of character for that family. In fact, this has me anticipating what we might learn uh, after the children are interviewed, or at least have the interviews that have been conducted, which I'm sure they have, are revealed. Even that four-year-old child who ended up spending 12 hours that day with his dad, beginning at 6 a.m. until 6 p.m., the day she disappeared. And we know forensically that Maya made her last social media communication at around 8.15 p.m. So that's about two hours before the kids were heard playing out in the backyard. Again, something out of character. At 8.15, she socialized something with our other family members. And we know forensically that Maya's phone was turned off at 1.25 in the morning. So we really have a pretty good time stamp of activities. And we can start to theorize that somewhere between 8 p.m. and uh, 10 p.m. when apparently loud bangs were heard and 1.25 a.m. when Maya's phone was turned off for good, that something might have occurred in that time frame. Now, this is a really good time to insert something that we learned later in the investigation. And that was that Larry failed to show up for work on January 6th. Now, that was presumably the day that Maya told her that he and she were going to get divorced. She intended to divorce him. He... Um, uncharacteristically didn't go to work on the 7th, the day of the fight. And he didn't show up for work on the 8th, the day after. Larry's missing work behavior was reported to be completely out of character for this guy. And that included talking to co-workers and his boss. Now, investigators haven't released their theory on what they believe Larry was doing during the 6th and 7th. But we do know that he told investigators that he left his home on the 7th at 6.45 a.m. to take his son to the beach. Only one kid out of the three they have. He took the four-year-old to the beach, hoping to give Maya some space. But he left the other two kids at home. Now, surveillance video shows that at 5.58 a.m., Larry gets into his Lexus, and, and remember, this Lexus had been positioned in the driveway. He drives out of the driveway and repositions the Lexus so that the back is at an angle slightly in the garage. Now, the place where he stopped the vehicle uh, near the opening of the garage was not visible on the recording, so we lost some really important evidence there. But 47 minutes later, at 6.45 a.m., the vehicle left the residence. Apparently with the four-year-old in tow, and returned 12 hours later at 6 p.m. Police have been unsuccessful, at least according to what's in the affidavit and what's been released, in validating where Larry's whereabouts were on the day that Maya was reported missing. Interest Interestingly, and quite frankly, uncharacteristically, Larry turned off his phone until 6.34 p.m., almost 30 minutes after he returned home on that day. At the time he turned his phone back on, Maya's family members were starting to arrive at the Miglietti home in response to calls with her, from her two older children who stated they'd been left at home without anything to eat. Maya's brother would tell police that he attempted to contact May at her locked door in her bedroom, but she never answered. They didn't force the door open at that time. They didn't know whether she was inside or not. Now, Maya's disappearance wasn't officially reported until January 9th, when Mary Chris, her sister, reported her missing. I, this is really disturbing. Husband didn't report her. The sister did. Mary Chris and her husband, Richard, have been absolutely amazing in leading the charge on this case from the very beginning. And frankly, I stand in awe 
of their strength and commitment. You might remember him coming on Profiling Evil. And, and if you haven't seen that, go back and watch those videos because it's really interesting to see what they were saying when this thing was fresh. But regardless of their initial efforts, Maya wasn't located. In fact, she missed her daughter's 11th birthday. It happened on January 10th. That was something that everybody said there is no way that she would miss. Her phone was never turned back on. By January 13th, Mary Chris and Richard had their first vigil, and they conducted their first search. Searchers included Maya's family, friends, a host of people who never had met Maya, but noticeably missing was Maya's husband, Larry Miliette. He remained at home with his children. When he was later challenged by the media about that decision, Larry simply responded that he was trying to keep everything as normal as he possibly could for the kids. Might be laudable. I don't know. You can put your comments down below on that one. I guess what my real question would be is, what would you be thinking at that moment if you were Maya's family members and her husband wouldn't come out and help look for her? <laughs> put your comments down below. Hey everybody, look who I'm hanging out with. And uh, listen, I'm not attending choir practice, but I just wanted to tell you that you need to be watching Profiling Evil YouTube. Don't miss it. I'm telling you, there's something there for you every single time. I never miss, you shouldn't either. And then the hours turned into days and the days into weeks. But finally, on January 23rd, Chula Vista police served a search warrant at the Miliete home in an effort to obtain evidence and clues about May's whereabouts. What they discovered, if anything, remains a mystery. Nearly a week later, police announced that Larry Miliete had retained an attorney. The once mildly cooperative grieving husband was no longer answering investigator questions. Well, as the weeks and months grinded forward, Maya's sister, Mary Chris, and her husband, Richard, organized and participated in search after search after search. And even more noticeable now than before, Larry Miliete never attended one of those searches. Now, police remained quiet about the investigation, but they did release a few updates, uh, including the number of interviews that they'd conducted, the growing number of residential, vehicle, mobile device, um, financial records, social media posts, and cloud data warrants that they uh, issued and received evidence on. In April of that year, a local news channel released a bombshell recording, recording of loud bangs, which many people interpreted as gunshot sounds. Now, the sound came near the Miliete home, the same sounds that were affiliated or associated with the sound of the children being outside playing. Again, this was completely uncharacteristic for the kids to be outside. But the sound occurred around 10 p.m. on January 7th. Police would only acknowledge the recording. It would later come out in some testimony in court, and they would acknowledge the, the sounds and the noise that could be interpreted as a gunshot, and only continued by saying it's being analyzed. A month later, police returned to the Miliete home with yet another search warrant. After that search warrant, they were observed hauling out box loads of evidence into a van before they headed out. Now this occurred shortly before a gun violence restraining order was issued against Larry. And keep in mind that during that search, police seized eight registered firearms and another 14 unregistered uh, weapons, ranging from handguns to long-barreled weapons to semi-automatic AR-15 rifles. At the same time, they released a disturbing photo of Miliete's four-year-old son standing on a table surrounded by the firearms and the ammunition. By June of that year, Larry Miliete responded with a 70-plus page court filing where he accused the police and the media of creating a toxic environment for him and for his children, all because of, of Maya's disappearance. A month later, police officially named Miliete as a person of interest in Maya's disappearance. 
Well, on October 19th, Larry Miliete was arrested on suspicion of murder in the disappearance of his wife, Maya. In total, at least to that point, detectives have written more than 67 search warrants. They've conducted more than 87 interviews, and they've explored more than 130 tips. Now, I suspect those numbers are continuing to grow. But with all this work, the question remains, can a prosecutor get a conviction without having Maya's body? And to answer this, the DA responded back to that very question, saying, quote, Although Maya's body remains missing, the law is very clear about filing murder charges in the absence of a body. In fact, there is case law that we will be using in this case that makes it even more clear that a missing body is circumstantial evidence and that there was foul play and that it's a murder investigation because somebody who takes their own life can't hide their own body, close quote. Well, now we all sit back and wait, just like Larry Miliette waiting in jail for his murder trial to begin in the fall of 2024. Now, he says he's not guilty. The children are remaining in the care of their paternal grandparents. That's Larry's folks. And after a year-long battle, Maya's family has finally been given some visitation rights with the kids. But Maya remains undiscovered. You know, I appeared on Court TV last night to talk about this case, and I wanted to share some of my thoughts with the host, Vinnie Politan. Here's some of the things that he posed to me in question form, and I thought you might enjoy catching that exchange in my response. This is the part of the case that just uh, is, is shocks me. Let's take a listen to Investigator James Rhodes talking about the spell casters. There was email communication um, on Mr. Miliente's phone to individuals whom he identified and identified themselves as spell casters. Is there a spell you can cast to incapacitate or make May not want to keep leaving me and my kids behind? Can you make her sick so she has to depend on us for care? I'm just at my wit's end trying to appease her. Good afternoon, Lilith. You know my situation and the target, May Miliete, born 1 May 1981. Please humble her down. She has become really selfish and narcissistic. Make her really sick and keep her sick until she realizes that it is us her family and myself are the only ones that will be by bedside on her deathbed, not her fake friends, friends on Facebook and other social media that she eyes more important than us. Please banish everyone else from her life with the exception of us four. Thank you, Lilith. Again, please keep the curse on her until she gives us more importance and not until she realizes that we are the only ones that are important her life her her life love us unconditionally and keep her home instead of constantly leaving us behind this is from mr Miliente to pagan 54 on december 31st 2020 at 6 16 p.m hi just fyi we're in the desert dirt biking and off reading for four days can you hex to have her hurt enough that she will have to depend on me and need my help? She's only nice to me when she needs me or sick. Thanks again. Maybe an accident or a broken bone. All right, Mike, what do you think of all that? Well, I think it's a whole bunch of voodoo going on that uh, makes no sense at all. But what really does make sense to me, Vinny, is with this being a circumstantial case, the power of the behavior being exhibited is really going to come into play. And I love laying this groundwork. We, we know that those spell casting requests ended when Maya disappeared. So that's interesting. These are going to be really important pieces of circumstantial evidence when we look at the fact that Larry's uh, leaving work a day before uh, this fight on the 7th and then he's left work on the 7th and he misses work on the 8th which is completely uncharacteristic those are behavioral things when we look at the fact that Maya's saying hey I want a divorce uh, on that state of the 6th all of a sudden all these pieces start to come together and they really start to pile on top of each other. We, we would love to have a body, 
but these are the kinds of things that make a circumstantial case really strong because it's got to be multiple forms of evidence to bring this case together. Vinny also asked me if I believed that Larry Miliete would ever confess to killing May. You know, this is an interesting behavioral question, and I responded to it based on the investment that Miliete has made in his statements thus far. Uh, statements to the police, to his own parents, to May's family, and I think to his own children, and of course, to all of us publicly. Let's watch this one. Mike King, uh, do you think he has the type of personality where he may someday admit this or reveal what happened? Or do you think never, we're, despite if he's convicted and the jury finds it, it's never going to happen? Yeah, personally, Vinny, I don't think he has the courage to admit if he is responsible for this. He's got his kids that he spent time either through emails or letters and those calls that he shouldn't have been making where he's told, telling him that he has nothing to do with this. He's got his parents that he's telling this, Maya's family that he's telling, and then the rest of the world that he's telling. That's going to be an awfully big step for him to, to say, hey, I was lying to you all. I did it. As our conversation wound down, Bobby was asked about the desert and a search that was going to be conducted there in the coming days. I thought his response was really interesting, and I want you to listen to that, plus a small bit of experiential contribution that I made on that one. And Bobby, before we run out of time tonight, um, your thoughts about these types of searches? Well, look, I just got off as, as a juror on a five-month murder trial where the, the victim was killed in 2008 here in Palm Springs, and his, his skull wasn't found until 2018. Um, and they had a conviction on, on, a, on the first case in 2013 without the body. We had the retrial. Um, so, so it's perfectly, you're perfectly capable of getting a conviction without the body. The search is very difficult. In that area of Southern California, you have a tremendous amount of rural area, desert-type area. I mean, it's the searchers have work cut out for them. If there's any leads that can narrow that searched area down, that's going to be key to, to as Erica said, I, I picked up right away when he mentioned the desert and the dirt bikes. I mean, anywhere that he's more familiar with, he's going to feel more comfortable with going. I would concentrate on those areas, um, but but it's 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 going to be a chore to, to, to search those areas. Did you say you were on a jury? Is that what you said? I just finished up as a jury, yeah. A jury at a five-month murder trial with special circumstances wow. here in California. Uh, Mike, we only have like two seconds. All, all I want to say is having spent time looking at mummies in Egypt, the desert's the perfect place to mummify a body. And if it is out there, there's going to be more physical evidence than in many other locations where that thing would decompose pretty rapidly. It's going to dry out. Big thank you, Erica Morris, Bobby Chacon, uh, Mike King. Well, the case of a missing mom, Maya Miliete, is quietly moving forward. You know, in the months that have passed, some of us have paid less attention to this case, and frankly, who can blame us with all the stuff that's going on? There are so many intriguing cases going on out there to follow. And while we're distracted at times, I hope that you look back periodically on this case and kind of keep up on it. But here's something I really do know, that Maya's loved ones continue to search on for this missing woman. In fact, Richard and Mary Chris are assembling a search as we speak. They continue to search for Maya's remains. Often, they do it alone, and from time to time, they get a community that will rally around them. But that dogged question keeps coming back. Perhaps not now that he's in jail, but at least back then, Where's Maya's husband, Larry Miliete, been? According to Richard and Mary Chris, he's never participated in a single search. Yeah, he might have an excuse now, now that he's sitting in jail. But what about then? Why didn't he help? Why did he prevent their children from seeing Maya's family? And by golly, don't forget, why didn't he ask his spellcasters the ones that he was hoping would keep her home to use their voodoo to bring Maya back to her children. I want to know what you think, everybody. Do you think Maya Miliete is going to be located before August of 2024? That's when her husband's going to face murder charges. 
I hope that you'll put your answers down below and please take time to answer one another's questions and answers and comments. Let's have a great discussion around this one. And remember that you can always find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and here on YouTube. And make sure you're checking out Profiling Evil's website at profilingevil.com. It's where we're trying to keep you up to date on things, including Profiling Evil podcasts, which you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Hey, please consider our channel memberships and please share us with your friends as you're hitting the like and the, and the thumbs up and all of that. It's just a great way that you can support all our efforts. So thanks so much. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene.